following message is presented by Community Gospel Church in Bremen, Indiana. It is our great privilege to share this ministry with you. We in no way intend for this to be a replacement for the local church. It is our prayer that this would serve as a resource to help make Jesus Christ known in our congregation and other congregations gathering across the world. For more information about Community Gospel Church, visit www.communitygospelchurch.com. you would open up in your Bibles or electronic device that has a Bible on it. Uh, We're in Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at the end of Galatians 5. We're going to start in verse 16, and we're going to walk all the way through. I'm fully aware that everything I'm about to preach today could be like a 10-week sermon series, okay? So for those who went to college or have heard of college They do these things called survey classes, and that's where you kind of have a crash course on a big amount of information. So today is the crash course on the fruit of the Spirit, and I'm sure I'll do some sort of disservice to something in the text where you're like, man, I wish you would have just expounded on that. Talk to me after church, and we'll... I'll keep going because I got information for days, but I won't do that to you this morning because I know you're hungry, you want to eat, all those other things, okay? So Galatians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 16, and like I said, we're going to go to the end, uh, which is verse 26. There was, uh, during the study of of Galatians, I came across the story of uh, a grandparent who was talking to their grandchildren about life. Grandma and Grandpa, have you ever done that? Have you ever wanted to impart the wisdom that you have from years and years and years to your grandchildren? Better question, do they listen to you? (laughs) <laughs> but a story is told of a, a grandparent, and they were talking to their grandkids about life. And the grandparent said that a fight is going on inside of me between two wolves. One wolf represents fear and anger, greed, lies, and pride. The other wolf stands for joy and peace and love and truth and faith. The grandparent looks at the grand children and says, the same fight is going on inside of you. It's inside of every other person. <laughs> and the kids look at grandma and grandpa and they say, well, well, hold on a second, which one wins, right? Kids want to know who wins. And the old grandparent said, the one that you feed. And believers, if we study Galatians 5, have the same problem, but it's not wolf. We wrestle against this thing called the flesh. So even though we've come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, even though we've confessed with our mouth, believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, okay, this body still hangs on me. Amen? And the older I get, the more I realize this body is not what it's cracked up to be. There's times where I wake up in the morning and I think to myself, why does this hurt? I didn't do anything to make that hurt. It just hurts. A buddy of mine told me the other day, he broke his ankle getting out of bed in the morning. And I thought... Man, you're getting old, and he's my age. And so I took it back immediately. But things just don't operate the way we want them to operate. And the Bible says, when you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the old is gone and the new has come. And he's talking about the spirit that is within us. Our old spirit is gone, but the new spirit is of God. It is the Holy Spirit that is within us. And so we have an opportunity in front of us, and that is either we're going to feed this flesh and we're going to continue to fall into sin, or we're going to feed the spirit. And he is going to be able to block some of that flesh. Now in Galatians, the previous verses, Paul's already explained to these young believers that their new nature, their freedom, if you go back to chapter 4, is found in faith with Christ. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ through faith, you're missing the point of life. Our opportunity here at Community Gospel Church is to show people their purpose by explaining the gospel and giving them the opportunity to respond to that gospel in faith. It is a glorious gift that is given to you. It is by grace that you have received this gift. It's not of works or else you would boast about it. And Paul says to these believers and to us, he says, don't abuse the freedom. And as a matter of fact, in the book of Romans, Paul says, uh, you look at me and you say, because of the grace that I have received, should I keep on sinning? He says, by no means. You can't use that grace in an abusive way. And he says, you have to show that you love Jesus like an inheritance that was given to you. You have to love people, even though some people are unlovable, amen? Galatians wanted to serve the Lord. 
but they struggled with worldly influence. Do you do the same thing? How are they supposed to feed the Spirit in a God-honoring way and not self? And that's where Paul comes in and he says, listen, I'm going to show you this morning the problem that we have. We feed the flesh over the Spirit. We've got to change that. Let's feed the Spirit over the flesh so that you can be victorious over whatever sin trips you up. <laughs> Everybody here has a sin that trips them up. Amen? Like all of us, right? And if you can't think of it and you're married, just look over at the person sitting next to you and say, hey, what's my problem? And they'll be like, I'll tell you in the car on the way home. And if you're not married, I'm sure somebody here knows your fight. Look at verse 16. Paul says, <clears throat> But I say this, in light of the fact that Christ has set us free, that's verse 1 through 15 in chapter 5, I say this, walk by the Spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, like wolves raging inside. They are opposed to one another to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Verse 18. But you, as believers in Jesus Christ, I put that in there. It's not in the text. So you're like, what translation is he reading out of? It's implied. Are led by the Spirit. You're not underneath works, or as Paul says, underneath the law. So let's start, okay, and let's look at what Paul means on how to be led by the Spirit in those first couple of verses. Paul struggles with the same problem that we struggle with. He is, or was, excuse me, a chief Pharisee. He practiced legalism better than anybody else. He knew all of the Old Testament law like the back of his hand. As a matter of fact, if he's a good follower of the law, he has the entire law memorized, all five books of it. And so as Paul, being a chief Pharisee who practiced legalism better than anybody else, is no stranger to this internal fight. Now, look at the text where it says to walk by the Spirit. First and foremost, what Paul says is if you want to walk by the Spirit, you have to accept the Spirit. In your pews, you'll see a little white book, and the gospel is explained. You can't walk in the Spirit if you don't have the Spirit. The way that you receive the Spirit is through faith in Jesus Christ. You admit that you're a sinner and come into the family of God through faith. You believe that Jesus' blood covers your sin. And so for believers to walk in the Spirit, they have to first be led by Him, not depending on themselves, but obedient to the Holy Spirit for guidance. Here's the crazy thing. The Holy Spirit doesn't operate automatically. He waits to be depended on, or another way to say that would be given control to. So you're saved by the grace of God, but now you got to give over control to Jesus. You say, I thought I already did that at salvation. No, no, no. You said, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm a believer that he is the way, the truth, and the life. You've made the decision to walk in the Spirit. Now you got to be dependent upon him. And so here, what he says is, you're dependent on the Spirit to not gratify the desires of the flesh. So what do I do as a believer? Well, first and foremost is you got to get in the fight. And you got to embrace the fact that there's a fight that's going on. All believers have two natures. First nature, sinful nature, that you received at birth because of Adam and Eve's sin. I didn't want it. Too bad. You got it. Okay? I didn't want mom and dad's home after they died. Too bad. You got it. Okay, I didn't want problems from family members. Too bad. You inherited those. Okay, I didn't want to go on the family reunion. Too bad. Some things are inherited even though you didn't want them. And you have this sinful nature. Two, your new nature is received at salvation. And both natures have desire. One is for evil. That's the flesh. The other is holiness. And so, as Paul says, if you look at the text, they are opposed to one another. No kidding. <laughs> And the Holy Spirit can block these evil cravings when he is allowed to do so. So how are we to be led by the Spirit? Well, it starts first and foremost in your mind of how you think. Paul explains this so much better in the book of Romans. He says those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about the sinful nature, sinful things. So let's just ask the question this morning before we go any further. Do you think about sinful things? And everybody here would say, oh, yeah, all the time, right? Sometimes I don't even have to think about thinking about sinful things. They just pop up. 
But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, they think about things that please the Spirit. In Romans 8, verse 9, he continues. He says, but you, as believers, you're not controlled by your sinful nature. See, some people think that they sinned because they think about some things, but they haven't given the opportunity to look at God and say, hold on a second, I can overcome that thought that has entered into my mind. And so you are controlled as believers by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. In other words, you are able to do far more abundantly than you could ever ask or imagine because of the fact that God has given you a gift. Remember, those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And so what Paul's establishing here is not a new form of legalism. When he says believers are not under the law... He's saying we have a mind and a body that is prone to rebel, that is enticed by sin, and we have an opportunity, obligation, command, and commitment to resist those desires by starting to feed the Spirit and stop feeding the sinful nature. (laughs) But how do I do that? Uh, How do I do that, Paul? You're, You're not making any sense. Just get to the point. Okay, he says, well, first and foremost, let's talk about this. Number one. You have to admit that you have a sinful nature, that there's something inside of you that rages against the things of God. It starts up in your mind. It starts up here. You have to say, I have a sinful nature. It's the alcoholic who sits in a room with other alcoholics. He says, my name is Jordan, and I'm an alcoholic. And everybody says, right? So we could acknowledge here in church, I am Jordan, and I am a sinner. And everybody says, Okay, now you're next. (laughs) In Jeremiah chapter 17, Jeremiah says, listen, our heart is deceitful above all things. And who can find the cure for it? Oh, God can. Don't be shocked by your tendency to selfishness. The first step is admitting that you have a problem. (laughs) Secular society got that right. But they missed the spiritual aspect of it. And that is that you have to then fully surrender and commit to Christ. Even the demons believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and that he rose, but their belief is a head knowledge. It's not a heart commitment. And so now I have to fully surrender to Christ. Some of you, and I know this is gonna be painful here this morning, okay? But some of you, when you came to know Jesus, you gave him 10% when he needs 100%. Some of you came to Jesus, you gave him 80%, but you left the basement to yourself. You have the keys to the shed, right? (laughs) I love you, Jesus, but you can't get in the shed. He's like, I want the shed. But you don't know what's in the shed. I know exactly what's in the shed. So I have to fully commit and surrender to Jesus Christ one time to be in his family, multiple times to overcome the battle that is being raged with the flesh. Jesus described this uh, in Um, Luke chapter 9, where he says, this is where you daily deny yourself. This is what Paul says in chapter 2, verse 20 of Galatians. I've been crucified with Christ. So knowing our sinful nature and its desires hinders the spirit, but we allow God the Father to enable the spirit to help us deny sinful natures, and we do this via prayer. This is why we pray. So I fully surrender to Christ daily. I talk to him about it. He loves to hear my voice. He's like a father with their kids. I know everything that my kids did in, uh, yesterday and the day before, but hearing them say it is a totally different story. I know what my kids struggle with, but hear them saying it is a whole different story. I love it, because now we can work with that. God can work with pliable and moldable hearts. Now look, Paul already said this in the end of chapter four, but it bears repeating. He says, now you have to find things for your hands and feet to do that are going to be uh, uh, beneficial for you, Right? Now we have to serve in love. Now you have to train yourself, what Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, you have to train yourself in godliness. <laughs> you have to train yourself to be godly. Oh, I thought I'd just come to know Jesus and everything goes away. No. I come to know Jesus and he uh, redeems me from my sin. He restores me. He forgives me. That's great. But now the training starts. It's like, hey, I'm going to run a 5K. All right, well, let's start running. Uh, I didn't realize that I had to run. You're telling me that we got a race? Yeah. You can't just sign up for a race and then sit on the couch. You got to actually participate in what is available to you. Now, the Bible speaks of this. Again, Paul to Timothy, and training in holiness. So you have to feed the spirit to win over the flesh. Go to verse 19. Watch. Paul continues. He says, now, let's talk about your flesh. 
The works of the flesh are evident. In other words, we don't have to wonder where they come from. They just pop up. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, amenity, which I always say that wrong, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you, as I warned you before, that those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. My name is Jordan, and I am a sinner, and everybody says... That list hits to the heart, doesn't it? And if it doesn't hit to your heart, it should. All right. Paul says we have to give into the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, but if we don't give into the fruit of the Spirit, we give into the fruit of the flesh, and this is how we fail. If you want to know how you're failing at being led by the Spirit, Paul gives this list here. Verse 19, let's look at this. These are the works of the flesh. Circle that word, obvious self-evident, manifested, which means they directly come from your human desires. You know exactly where they come from. Now, here's where the survey happens. Paul lists these sins essentially in three different categories. And if you were living in Galatia, okay, modern day Turkey, you would have understood this because they were evident not only in the people, but also in the pagan world. First category, there were sexual sins that were prevalent in all of society. Is sexual sin still prevalent in our society today? Yes, it's also very prevalent in the hands of people with devices. So it's uh, open and available to us. We see it all over the place, but it's also something that we participate in private with too as well. Sexual immorality was the first one. This is where we get our word pornography from, okay? So this is anything that we look at that is going to be against God and the way that he originally orchestrated men and women to function underneath the covenant of marriage, This is any forbidden sexual behavior between people, indirect or direct, uh, and then that moves into impurity. A moral uncleanliness, crude insensitivity in sexual matters. It is the excessive use of sexual humor. Ouch, right? Then it moves into sensuality. This excessive indulgence, if you will, or open indulgence where people have no sense of shame or restraint. Now, here's the crazy thing about these sins, right? We look at it and we go, oh, I can like name friends who, who wrestle with these things. No, you wrestle with these things. Because even though sometimes you're not verbal about them, you are still thinking them. And Jesus says, just as a way a man thinks, so he is. And let's just not throw men under the bus. Women deal with this too, Okay. Lynette, it's really hot in here. (laughs) All right. I told you I was coming for you. All right, number two. If maybe sexual sins aren't your, your problem, let's look at religious sins. Now, again, these are prevalent to pagan culture, okay? Verse 20. Idolatry is anything that you put over God or a substitute for God. Sorcery is the involvement with powers of evil or when an idolatrous person acts in a submissive role with relation to evil. Witchcraft is when a person is an active agent who manipulates the powers of evil. So we're essentially saying, like, if God will do this for me, if he won't do this for me, then I'm going to go find another means to do that. (laughs) It's like professional sports players who have superstitions. Okay, if I wear these pair of socks for the whole playoff season, we'll win the championship trophy. Not necessarily true. Change your socks. Okay, you stink. Everybody else does too. Now, when I look at these, okay, let's go back for a second. Okay, I look at these and I can see slivers, okay, in my life. And I can see slivers in my past life. I can see slivers of of where it's popular in the circles that I populate, okay? Same is true here with religious sins. We all fall short of these things. And our friends fall short of these things, okay? So so what Paul's doing is he's just identifying for us that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Look at the third category. If you don't struggle with sexual sins, if you don't struggle with religious sins, then how about sins pertaining towards people, specifically difficult people? He says, here, these are motivated by your desires. You have unresolved conflict in your life. You're bitter towards one another. Your strife is conflict. You hate other people, namely people who cut you off in traffic. Or when the construction is so bad that they just won't let you through. 
You're jealous. You feel resentment that someone else has a better life than you, deserves more than you. Paul uses the word zeal here, both in a negative and a positive way. Negative here, positive was in regards to his passion for preaching the gospel. Look at number four, fits of anger, outbursts uh, for selfish reason, uncontrolled behavior. Rivalry, an approach to life that tries to get ahead uh, at other people's expenses. Dissension, strong disagreements or quarrels. When you play devil's advocate just because you want to, because it riles up people. I'm not a fan of that, by the way. Divisions, tendency to look for allies in conflict. Envy, the desire to possess something awarded or achieved by another. What Paul's doing is saying we all sin, right? Every single one of us. Like I look at that list and I'm like, yep, I got all those going on for me. And here's what he says. He says, they just pop up. You don't even have to try. They just come natural. And he's not surprised. Many of these are social sins that are often seen in our churches today. As a matter of fact, you can look at the sexual sins, you look at the religious sins, and then you go to these sins pertaining towards people. And a lot of people in secular society would say, that's the church. That's a problem. (laughs) <laughs> and then Paul says, hey, let's just throw two more on the fire. Why not? He says, how about drunkenness, which is the excessive use of wine and strong drink? I still to this day can't think of a good reason why you would drink alcohol. That's just me. I've been down that path, drank alcohol myself, don't see any benefit to it, been sober for a long time. Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, he highlights the contrast between living by the flesh and living by the spirit. He says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the spirit. Then he talks about orgies, which are drunken, carousing parties often filled with sexual promiscuity promiscuity associated with the festivals of pagan gods. And then, I love it, in the text he says, and the like. So he says, hey, if I didn't mention your sin, just write it in the blank. Okay? And so... Here, what what we see here is, what he's saying is is what C.S. Lewis said a long time ago. The true Christian, their nostrils are to be continually attentive to the inner cesspool. I am aware of my sin. You should be aware of your sin. Uh, You don't have to come up to me and be like, Jordan, I see you struggling with this. I would already name it. I'd be like, you're 100% correct. Absolutely. Like, I'm, I'm totally aware of it. And if you're not aware of it, you need to ask and pray to the Lord that he would reveal to you. Now, here's the crazy thing. Look back at the passage. It says, Paul declares, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a hard passage of scripture, even harder to preach, and I'm going to say it because it's got to be said. That doesn't mean that believers who lapse into any of these sins will lose their salvation. However, those who habitually exhibit these characteristics reveal themselves to be enslaved to sinful human desires and are not children of God. So what is he saying? If I am not (laughs) um, concerned about the sin that trips me up and entangles me, I should be concerned if I really truly know Jesus or not. Like, if I am not convicted in my core about the things that are manifesting in my flesh, then I should be concerned because maybe, just maybe, I don't know Jesus. If there's no conviction taking place in your heart, then maybe, just maybe, you've never committed fully over to Christ. Because the Holy Spirit makes us aware of these things. So the question on the table is, are we working towards removal of these things or continuing to be enslaved by them? Which one do you feed? Jesus says, radical amputation. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your left eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. You have to resist flesh in order to be led by the Spirit. If there's no fight inside of you, then maybe you don't have faith. And that's so hard to say. But you have to have the awareness, okay, that if there's no fight taking place, if there's no conviction of sin, then maybe there's no spirit inside of me that convicts that sin. That's tough. So Paul says, I don't want you to fail. I just want you to see that you've fallen short of the glory of God, right? Now, now he's going to build you back up. I love it. Paul just like rips you to pieces, and he's like, hey, let's, 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 let's just bring you back up, okay? So here's how you submit to the fruit of the Spirit. Here's how you walk in the Spirit. Now, notice, and you can circle this, the word fruit, circle that. It's singular. It's not fruits, okay? We don't have like a bowl of oranges here. 
uh, some oranges and apples and bananas and all these other things. It's not a fruit basket, if you will. It's like grapes. Like, you don't say, hey, go pick me up a grape at the grocery store. You get grapes. All of these fruit exists as a unit. And they are completely unlike the spiritual gifts. Now, here's the crazy thing, okay? Track with me. The fruit of the Spirit are byproducts of an obedient life. I don't have to think about the manifestations of the flesh because they just happen. They just pop up, and all of a sudden I'm convicted about them. I'm like, oh, man, this is a problem in my life. God, what do I do? He says, you be obedient to me, my word, and my will, and watch the Spirit take over the flesh. And so here's what he says. He says, these are going to take time. You're going to have to grow. You're going to have to care for it, and you're going to have to cultivate it. And you're thinking to yourself, man, I can't even keep a house plant alive. How am I going to keep the fruit of the Spirit alive? Well, that's where Jesus comes in and does great work because I can't keep a house plant alive either. Matter of fact, that's why Bethany's got the garden because they would all be dead right now if it was entrusted to me. Now, since the Holy Spirit produces fruit, our job is to display it. And it's displayed when we are filled with obedience. The key here is obedience, obedience, obedience. The fruit of the Spirit does three things, okay? Number one, it will separate you from an evil world. The more you are obedient to God's word, will, and ways, the more you will find yourself uh, uh, getting further and further away from the world. It's a weird thing. It's super weird. Like you'll find yourself in conversations and people will start having these uh, coarse jokings and you'll be uncomfortable with it. You'll be like, why am I uncomfortable here? Sin will make you so uncomfortable. You'll be in a situation where somebody is uh, elevating some sort of idolatry and you'll be uncomfortable about it. You'll start to see yourself distanced from the world. The second thing is, it will reveal God's power within you. There's times when you uh, are obedient to God's word, will, and ways, and all of a sudden the fruit like manifests and it pops up, and all you can say is, hey, thanks, Jesus. And you're like, I don't know how I did that. And he's like, I, I, I did, I knew. So here we see divine power within us. When, when a fruit of the Spirit is displayed and you see it, and the Holy Spirit gives you eyes to see it, you'll be fascinated by it because it's God's work in your life. And then it will help you become more like Jesus. And it will give you a full life. It will give you a life of peace and joy. And you will find yourself complete. Now, just like there were categories in the flesh, watch this. This is how we manifest the fruit of the Spirit through obedience. Number one, inward that has to come from God. Life, uh, next week we're going to talk about this a little bit. Um, Yeah, I'll give it away. Okay, so next week is Father's Day. And uh, my friend Josh Wyland and I are doing a pastor swap. So he's going to come here, and he's going to preach to you. And I'm going to go to Wawa C, and I'm going to preach to them. And he's going to say, hey, if you don't like Community Gospel Church, come to Wawa C. <laughs> and I'm going to tell his congregation, hey, if you don't like Wawa C, come to Community Gospel, right? And, uh, and what we're going to do is we're doing the same message. So we've been preparing this message for a while from Proverbs chapter 4. And um, we've been working together with it. It's been super, super fun. And then since it's Father's Day, we're going to give you guys uh, free Kona ice. So Kona ice truck will be here after church. And, uh, and everybody in church gets free Kona ice here and at Wawa C. Cool? You think I'm joking. I'm 100%. I'm, I'm, I'm 100%, okay? Because um, I want you to, to experience what it, what it feels like to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. It's like, it's like a, a snow cone, which is just joyous, Okay? But the reason I tell you that is Proverbs chapter 4, now I got you talking, you're like, is he for real? I'm, I'm dead serious. Uh, Proverbs chapter 4 talks about manifesting a life to be lived from the inside out, not the outside in. Okay? So that's the whole message. And what Paul's saying here is he's saying, listen, this is how we live inward from Christ. Life is to be lived inside, and then it comes out, not outside in. And where does that come from? Look at the first fruit of the Spirit. Love, which is the word agape, is shown by Jesus in self-sacrificing, just what Russ said. This is how God loved the world, that he gave his son for us as sinners. Love is the foundation for all other fruit. Love is not an emotion. Love is a choice. God chose to love you. You, in turn, choose to love him. That's the start of obedience. Obedience manifests itself after I choose to love God in loving other people. So I'm making the choice to obey. Then he says, if you choose to love like God loves you, you will experience joy, not happiness, because God's not concerned about your happiness. He's concerned about your holiness. And if you're holy, you experience this joy in your life. 
Joy is an inner rejoicing regardless of circumstances. It's not happiness as joy exists in times of unhappiness. Joy comes in our relationship with God through faith in Christ. So you start with love. This agape love, God loves me, I choose to love him in return and his people, produces in me an inner rejoicing, and then I have peace. The reason you don't have peace and I don't have peace is we're pursuing the pursuits of this world instead of the fruit of the Spirit given to us so freely and abundantly. Are you tracking? So now I have this inner quietness. <laughs> I'll never forget when my youngest uh, told me that she was going to meditate on something. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa what did you just say? And she's like, yeah, we were at the dinner table, I believe. And she's like, you just go like this. You go, um, and I was like, okay, homeschooling might be an option. <laughs> and then COVID hit and homeschooling was an option. Um, but we were like, no, 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 that's not how it works. We meditate on scripture. We meditate on God's word and it produces in us an inner quietness. We don't have to hum anything. We pray everything, Okay. So this is the trust in the fact that God is sovereign, that he's going to have justice regardless of difficult people and circumstances. Let him be the judge, okay? So there's where it starts. What am I obedient towards? I'm obedient towards God, his love for me, his joy that he has given to me, the peace. And then watch this. Paul continues. He says, now, if you're faithful in letting the inward, okay, produce the external, now your relationship with other people will change, So oftentimes the relationship with other people doesn't change because the inside hasn't changed or become disciplined. Now I'm going to be patient. I'm going to put up with people who continually irritate me because I think sometimes I irritate God. But he says, I don't mind because we're working on it. Two, kindness, which is charity towards others as God showed charity towards us. It's the initiative to respond to a person's need. What is the two greatest commandments? You should love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first category, the fruit of the Spirit. What's the second? To love your neighbor as yourself. Who's your neighbor? Anybody who has a need in which you are able to meet. And when you do that, you will have goodness. You will desire to do good to others even if they don't deserve it. Goodness absorbs an offense and responds with a positive action. Goodness, let me just show how this is manifested in American life. Goodness is when you want somebody to succeed. That's goodness. When you want the best for them, even if they're your worst enemy. That you want what's best for them. And it's not what's best in regards to human standards, it's what's best in God's eyes. Okay, third category, general character traits now of a believer. And what he talks about here is that you would be faithful, you'd be reliable, trustworthy, gentle, considerate of other people, ask people questions about them instead of talking about yourself, have mastery over sinful human desires, and all of this is surrender. Initially, we feel like we're going to lose control. And here's the crazy thing, the more you lose control, the more God can work. The more you give up control, the more God says, I can work. And he will lead us to an exercise of self-control that would be impossible on our own strength. Now, go and look at uh, verse 23. Paul said that God gave law to make people aware of their sins and to restrain evil. But no one would make a law against the fruit of the Spirit. They're never sinful. They're never evil. And a society where all people acted according to the fruit of the Spirit would need very few, if any, laws. And so a believer, literally those who are of Christ, have been crucified with Christ and identify with Jesus. It's a co-crucifixion. Our sin nature isn't eradicated or even rendered inactive, but our sin has been judged. And so victory over sinful natures, as Paul says in the last passage, over passions and desires has been provided by Christ in Christ You continue to know this truth and have faith when temptation comes. So what Paul's saying is in obedience to the Spirit, you produce fruit and you're able to be victorious. The reason you're not victorious right now is you're depending on yourself for whatever circumstance and situation trips you up. It's really that simple. We look at this passage of Scripture and we think it's got to be more complex than that. It's really not. If you start to get rid of the world and its ways and you start implanting the word and its ways, you will just see things change radically. It's like this. 
They tell people who smoke, right? What's the first thing you're supposed to do if you want to quit smoking? You're supposed to sell your car. That seems just like a crazy endeavor. Like, why would I sell my car? Majority of people who smoke, smoke in their car. And they have made muscle memory so prevalent in their life, they get in their car and they think, I need a cigarette. And so the first thing that they do is they radically amputate that which enables them. If it's not the car, then it's another room in the house. They say, you gotta revamp the whole room in your house. Wherever you go to smoke, you gotta revamp that room. And these people, they look at it and they go, I can't do that. That's so radical. Why would I do something so radical? Well, if you really want transformation, you gotta radically transform yourself. If secular society says that, then why is it so like crazy that us in the spiritual world say the same thing and we have a higher yield? Isn't that nuts? So what Paul's saying is he's saying, listen, If you are obedient to the Spirit, you produce fruit. You're victorious. You're not victorious because you're continuing to submit yourself to the Word or the world instead of the Word. Look at verse 25. This is how he concludes. He says, If, and I love that, if, if what? If we walk or live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So in other words, he says, listen, if you have submitted to Jesus Christ in a relationship with him, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus, if you say, I'm a sinner and I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, then you have to walk by him as well. Let's not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. He says, no, let's do something greater. To give into the flesh is to welcome divine judgment, but to submit to the spirit is to produce divine fruit. And since the Holy Spirit makes believers alive by regeneration, that's John 3, each believer is commanded to keep in step. Now notice, I'm jumping here in Galatians chapter 6, verse 16. You keep in step with the Spirit. And what he's saying is, he's saying step by step, little by little, believers can conform to the Holy Spirit's direction or they would become conceited and provoking and envying one another. So which one do you feed? Do you feed the flesh or do you feed the Spirit? Are you enabling yourself to fall to the flesh or have you radically amputated something so that you can produce uh, fruit that is given by the Spirit? It is no, (laughs) it's no surprise. I love working out. Like, it's just... I don't know why. It's like an addiction that just doesn't leave. I've prayed and I said, God, if you just help me to stop working out, that'd be amazing. And uh, he's like, no, I'm gonna keep that you know, inside uh, of you. And, and here's what I've learned. There's people who come up to me and here's what they wanna know. Every single time, this happens all the time. What are you taking? I get that all the time. People come up and they're like, hey, what are you taking? <laughs> I tell them the same thing every time. Hard work and dedication. That's it. Like, they want to know, how much protein do you take? Uh, they want to know, hey, do you do steroids, right? Like, we get that all the time. Like, how, how, much, how many milligrams of steroids do you pump into your body? I'm like, I, I don't. I'm like, I love tuna and rice, and uh, if Bethany allows it, beans from time to time. That's <laughs> where I live at. And it, <laughs> it's crazy. They look at me and they go, there's no way you got that way from hard work and dedication. I said, listen, I didn't start waking up at four o'clock in the morning. I used to wake up at eight, then it got to be 7.30, and then it was 7.15, and then it turned into seven, and then it was 6.30, and it was just this gradual increase. It didn't happen overnight. My buddy Jonathan, who used to be a worship leader at this church, he's a marathon runner. He could run a a full marathon in two hours and 30 minutes, and people walk up to him all the time, and they would say, how did you get so fast? And he would say, I put one foot in front of the other, and I depend all the time on the fact that God is going to get me to the finish and that he can decrease the pain that is so prevalent in my body. It didn't happen overnight. It's just this slow progression. Now, here's the crazy thing. Slow progressions and things that are good— Um, And the things that are godly happen little by little, day by day. The same is true with those that want to trip you up and see you fail. You can participate the exact same way. You can participate in, in whatever you choose to participate in, but it comes down to daily dependence. In order to be victorious in What God has in store for us, you have to be obedient. It comes down to obedience. It's obedient. Either you are going to serve yourself or you're going to serve your Savior. It's just that simple. You're going to make daily decisions step by step of whether you're going to feed the flesh or you're going to feed the Spirit. 
And if you feed the spirit, you'll be victorious over sin and worldly struggles. I promise it won't happen instantly. But man, little by little, day by day, you'll see yourself completely radically transformed. If you would look at the works of the flesh and who I was 10 years ago, as opposed to who I am today, man, I still struggle with a ton of stuff, but not like I used to. Not like I used to. As a matter of fact, what's manifested is new problems, right? Here's, here's some new things. And God's like, hey, if you can handle this, let's see if you can handle this. All right? So, so this is important to us. This is super important to us. All right, again, I, I just want to ask any questions, but I can't because we, we got to close up. All right, let me pray for you. <clears throat> um, Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for uh, the ways that you have manifested yourself, not only in my life, but in, in these people's lives too as well, in our church, and the ways that you're working in and through community gospel. It's amazing to watch. Um, I've seen it firsthand uh, through my eyes of, of seeing people who are obedient. And uh, man, I think about 10 years ago, God, of who we used to be and some of the people who were here uh, when we first started and where they were at then and where they're at now. It's amazing to watch. It's amazing to see that little by little, step by step, uh, they've chiseled away at the flesh and they're starting to really produce fruit. Uh, and, and I'm so thankful for that, God, that um, the examples in the Old Testament, there, there's some people who, who didn't see fruit until they were like in their 80s and 90s, and, and, but they were still faithful to you. They were constantly striving to eliminate the flesh and be obedient to the Spirit and, and see what, what is manifested from it. So, God, as we're, we're here today before you, and as we come before you, the first thing that we want to do is just acknowledge our sin. As Bethany said just a little bit ago, we all acknowledge, myself as well, that we're sinners and we fall short of your glory. And God, uh, as a congregation, we do that. We understand that. We wrestle with this thing called the flesh. And so, um, we ask for your forgiveness if you're gathered here uh, with us today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the first thing you do is you pray to Jesus Christ. You say, God, I know I'm a sinner and I want to start walking in the spirit. I want to surrender myself. I want to I produce fruit. I'm, I'm tired of fighting this battle alone. And, and he will, he'll come and he'll do a great work in your life. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you'll be saved. You'll be covered by his blood. That's an amazing thing. Come into the family of God, it's open. Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. Anybody who hears my voice opens up that door and lets me in. He will be mine, I will be his. It's the greatest gift that you could receive. Don't be so foolish to run out of here without knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And maybe you're here this morning and you're saying, I've heard that message forever. But but I, but I don't know, like, I, I don't have this fruit of the Spirit, so I'm not manifesting fruit in my life. I, I see more fleshly desires. Maybe you never came to know Jesus. De dedicate your life to him. Say, I, I sat in a pew for 25 years before I came to really know Jesus Christ. Surrender your heart to him. There's, there's no day like today. And so many of us have, have understood what it means to know Jesus. And we've accepted Jesus and we've confessed and we believe, but we still wrestle with this thing called the flesh. Now, God, help us to be obedient to what you have entrusted to our care. We surrender individually and corporately to you. We surrender to your spirit. We surrender to control. We surrender all of these things. We ask that the spirit would block these fleshly desires and that he would enable us to do far more abundantly than we could ever ask or imagine. God, help us produce fruit. We're gonna go into the community this week, the Fireman's Festival in Bremen. Those of us who are from Mishawaka, South Bend, we're gonna, we're gonna go into that furnace, God, and we ask that you would help us to be your hands and feet. When people see us picking up trash, we ask that you would help us to proclaim that it's only through you and through your power that we're able to serve because you first served us. As we go into our workplaces, God, in the next couple of days, as we go into our homes, wherever you plant us, wherever you position us, help us to listen to the voice of the Spirit and be obedient to it so that we could produce a harvest where it would just be so plentiful. And may we give you all the glory that you so rightfully deserve. God, I pray for victory for these people, for myself too as well. I pray for victory for us, that we would be more than conquerors in Jesus Christ, who loved us, who saved us, who set us free, who sanctifies us, who gives us the ability to know him, to understand him, to live in the truth 
that the day is coming. You're going to call us home. We want to hear your voice say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So God, help us inside out. Be your hands and feet. It's in your name we pray. God's people said, amen. Thank you for listening to the Community Gospel Church podcast. If you would like to support this ministry financially, simply log on to communitygospelchurch.com and click the Contribute tab.